Well, thank you, Ed, and thank you, Kevin, and thanks, moms, for letting us be a part of that moment. I think I agree with Ed. I think it's a powerful thing to sit here and to see people come forward and to just ask to be prayed for and to be blessed. And uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to be your church on Mother's Day and to be that place where we surround you with the love and the blessing of Jesus Christ. And so happy Mother's Day. I was thinking to myself, if that were Father's Day, it would have gone a lot quicker. Um, <laughs> We probably would have gone something like this. You good? I'm good. You want to do like the Our Father or something, you know? And then, and then it would have been done. But you know what? There's, there's beauty in that. Let's pray. Lord, to be your church, to be your people, to gather in the spirit of love and faith and hope is a powerful, powerful thing. So powerful, Lord, that we dare not undertake it upon ourselves. We dare not think that we generate it. We do it in the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I pray that you are honored, that you are lifted up. I pray that all that come here this morning, whatever their state, whatever their mindset this morning, whatever their pain, whatever their joy, may they find their anchor in you. We're grateful for you, Jesus. You are the author and the perfecter of our faith. We're grateful for this church, and it's a great opportunity to be your gathered ones this morning. May, you, um, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So when I was probably about 10 years old, we used to have candles at the dinner table. I don't remember why I thought it was a good idea to try to hold my napkin as close as possible to the flame, but one time I did, and my mom continually would remind me forcefully that this wasn't a good idea, but I didn't listen. And then one day, the napkin caught on fire, and in a, in a calm state of mind, like any 10-year-old with fire in his hand, you know what I instinctively did? I threw it at my mom. <laughs> now, thankfully, I missed, and my mom was able to stomp it out. It wasn't one of my greater moments, but I would argue that in that moment, I was modeling what I would call, for sake of this sermon, the mom instinct. And you know what the mom instinct, it's this instinct in every kid out there that says something like this, you know, I might ignore you, I might not listen to you, I might not pay very much attention to you, but when my life catches on fire, I'm going to you, right? That's what I like to call the mom instinct, you know, Ann and I both love our kids, and we're both engaged in raising them, and we have similarities and differences, but one major difference I know between Ann and me is this, that I pick up my kids, Ann carries them. She bears the weight of their lives inside of her. And, you know, she's keyed in on different levels than me, not, that, not better or whatever, but just different Two phrases that I've heard uh, that I've kind of tucked away a lot when I think about homes and Mother's Day and all that stuff is Robert Frost in this great poem, Death of a Hired Man, with this man comes home to die and the, the two people that are the homeowners basically come to this conclusion, they're wondering, why is this guy here? He was only a hired man, why is he coming home to our place to die? And Robert Frost has a line in the poem, he says, Home is that place where when you have to go there, they have to let you in. You know? Home is that place where when you have to go there, they have to let you in. And several years ago, the year after my mom died, Lori DeYoung said this line that I've never forgotten, and that is this, No matter how old you get, home is where your mom is. And that's become more and more true to me as one who's lost both a mom and a mother-in-law, that no matter how old you get, home will always be 
where your mom is. The mom instinct. I would define the mom instinct as a cry for help that expects an answer based on who you're crying to. A cry for help that expects an answer based on who you are crying to. Psalm 31, the psalm for this morning, I don't know if they picked this psalm because it was Mother's Day. I I tend to doubt it. But as I kept reading it this week in preparation for the sermon, I kept thinking, this is an example of the mom instinct in some ways, but pointed ultimately to God. Let's look again at Psalm 31, verses 1 to 5. Listen to the, to the rhythm of this psalm. It's like desperation, rescue me, but the cry for help is rooted in the character of God, not in, you know, I'm going to be rescued because I'm so good. It's more about, I need to be rescued because God, you're good, not me. Psalm 31 says this, O Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be put to shame. Rescue me, for you always do what is right. Bend down and listen to me. Rescue me quickly. quickly. Be for me a great rock of safety, a fortress where my enemies cannot reach me. You are my rock and my fortress. For the honor of your name, lead me out of this peril. Pull me from the trap my enemies set for me, for I find protection in you alone. I entrust my spirit into your hand. Rescue me, Lord, for you are a faithful God. One commentator described this prayer, the psalm. This psalm is a prayer, right? Some, some psalms are poems. Some psalms are worship songs. This psalm is actually a prayer. And as one commentator described it, he said it is a model of a prayer that expects to be answered. The psalmist prays with great confidence, but his confidence, and this is important, is not in himself. His confidence is in the character and the love and the mercy of God. And so when he finds himself in this great dilemma... He is exercising the mom instinct, right? You know, when life is on fire, even though I haven't looked to, listened to you, I'm looking at you now. I turn to you, mom. I turn to you because I know you will answer me. And in the same way the psalm is saying, we turn to God not because of the great things we've done. He makes no case whatsoever for his own righteousness. He makes no case whatsoever that God should listen to his prayers because he's been a good person. No, his only case is the character of God. His only confidence, his only expectation that God will listen to him is because God is a God of great love and mercy. You know, it's interesting. I was telling um, everybody when we were praying, I did some background research on the word mercy. And the Hebrew word for mercy actually comes from the Hebrew word for womb. Did you know that? That the word, that particularly the word that's used here for mercy, is a word that originally meant womb. And so the mercy of God was meant to be that, that, that life-giving, life-producing, sacrificing, carrying love of God. When the Hebrews were using the word for the merciful, mercifulness of God, they went to this image of the womb, this, this love that carries you. God hears our pleas for help and answers them based on who he is, not us. The carrying love of God is like a mother's love. Barbara, um, let me get, make her, give her name right. Um, Barbara Box, Barbara Bow, said that over a hundred times, this Hebrew word for mercy that is rooted in this idea of womb is used to describe God's love in the Old Testament. 
like a mother's love that you just rest in. You don't strive for, you don't make sure you've earned it. It's just a caring, sustaining love. Now, I know that, you know, no moms are perfect, and, and this is obviously, you know, based on the ideal, but I think it's a wonderful image this morning for us to just ponder in the same ways that we reflect on and honor the caring love of our moms, of our wives, and all of that stuff, that that is the very root of the mercy of God. So your neediness, your brokenness, your bad decisions, your shallowness, your, your selfishness, you know, they may drive other types of love away, but they never drive away the caring, merciful womb-like love of God. Do you believe that? Do you think that? I know for a lot of us, we think to ourselves, you know, I, I, like, I got to get my act together uh, to prove myself so that God will listen to me. We, here's the thing. You may have to get your act together. I'm all for getting your act together. You may have to clean your life up. I hope you do. I hope you live great and beautiful and wonderful lives. But don't confuse that with the carrying love of God. The mercy of God is there. The mom instinct that you feel was put there by God. The love, the mercy of God. It's interesting. Psalm 31 is actually quoted three other times in the Bible. Three other characters in the scriptures quote from Psalm 31 at, at moments in their own lives where they're struggling. Um, the first person to sort of allude to Psalm 31 was Jonah. Jonah's an interesting character because Jonah was a prophet called by God to take God's message of redemption to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. The Assyrians were the, the, the great bully on the block in Jonah's day who were constantly threatening, threatening the people of Israel. They were bad people. And God called Jonah, right, to go and take his message of love and forgiveness to the Ninevites at the very capital of this nation of Assyria. And Jonah did what probably a lot of people would have done, right? He said, no way, God, not those people. I am not going to obey your command. Well, Jonah learned quickly that that's probably not a good idea because soon he found himself in the belly of a whale. So if you find yourself in the belly of a whale, you might want to try Psalm 31, right? Because he alludes to the mercy, the undeserved mercy of God, and sure enough, the whale spits him out. Disobedient hearts that cry out for the mercy of God are heard by God. Jeremiah is the next character in the, in the scriptures that quotes from Psalm 31. This is all according to the commentator Derek Kidner, by the way, in case you're scoring me at home. But the prophet Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. <clears throat> if there was ever a person in, in the Bible you didn't want to be, it would be Jeremiah. God calls Jeremiah to a ministry that's just God-awful. He's got to preach the, the, the condemnation and the mercy of God to a nation under siege. He's got to be God's minister as God's people are being carted out off into exile, captured by the Babylonians. Jeremiah is the one that kept saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And they did it anyway. And when they're suffering the penalty, Jeremiah has to travel with them as they live under the discipline of God. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Because, not because of what he did, but because the circumstances in which he lived. 
And Jeremiah, as he is wandering off with God's people into exile, quotes from Psalm 31. This same message, this same image. So I ask you this morning, Church One, is your life turning out like you hoped? Is your life looking a lot harder than you expected? Is life not going according to plan? Do you find yourself in circumstances, maybe none of your own doing, that are very difficult and very heartbreaking? If you're in those moments, cry out for the mercy of God. Let the mom instinct, that sense of like, God, I don't know how I got here. I don't know why I'm here, but I need you right now in the midst of these circumstances. Jonah, Jeremiah, recognized this maternal instinct, right? This mom instinct in the, in the heart of God. And they reference Psalm 31 as they are wrestling through with God in the issues of life. But the third person to quote from Psalm 31, and this is the person that it is most clearly known, is Jesus. Unlike Jonah and Jeremiah, the this, this suffering of Jesus was completely undeserved. Jeremiah was suffering for the sins of the people. Jonah was suffering for his own disobedience. But on the cross, Jesus didn't deserve any of it. He didn't deserve what was being done to him. He didn't deserve to be mocked. He didn't deserve to be whipped. He didn't deserve the scorn, the hatred, all of it. But it's interesting, on the cross, Jesus didn't look to his mother for care, but instead took care of his mother. Isn't that interesting? That is a very side note in my sermon. But of the seven last words of Jesus, one of them was to make sure that his mom was taken care of. That's a powerful thing. Think about that. On the cross, Jesus didn't cry out for his mercy for himself. But on the cross, instead, he asked God to forgive his persecutors because they did not know what they were doing. On the cross, uh, Jesus didn't demand paradise for himself. He didn't try to get out of the suffering, but instead offered paradise to an undeserving criminal. And on the cross, according to the Gospel of Luke, the last words of Jesus came right out of Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands, O God, I commit my spirit. It's a great model for us, you know, when we find ourselves in those dark places of sin and death, when we, we, we feel like we, we need some place to go, you know, we can, we can commit our spirits to God. One person wrote a prayer based on that that I liked. It says, I commit myself to you, O God, in my living and in my dying, in the good times and the bad, wherever I am, I have a place in your hands, O God. For safekeeping. Jesus cried out, Into your hands, O Lord, I commit my spirit. Remember what I said that the initial idea is that, that, that this psalm is a, is a cry of mercy that expects an answer. And the great dilemma, right? I mean, if you if you think about like other than moms, right? Other than a mom, who would give mercy to an undeserving cry? Maybe for a deserving cry, we would offer mercy. But, you know, like, um, I happen to like the Washington Capitals, and I hate the Pittsburgh Penguins. And those of you that know this know why I'm saying that. And I love the fact that they lost yesterday. It brings me joy. <laughs> I, I want no mercy on the Pittsburgh Penguins, right? Right? 
Like that's the way of the human heart. I don't want to offer mercy to an undeserving cry. But why, why can we have confidence, right? Because this is the dilemma. You say, oh, Mike, this all sounds really good, you know, that I can, I can be a mess and I can cry out to God, but it sounds good, but the truth of the matter is I don't have a lot of confidence in that because I know I don't deserve the mercy of God. You don't. But Jesus did. Jesus did. Because he had committed no wrong. He had done no sin. He had lived a righteous life. And he didn't deserve to die. And on the cross, as he's paying the penalty that we should be paying, he cries out to God, into your hands I commit my spirit. His perfection, his obedience, his love, his righteousness is now ours to hold on to. And it's because of him that we are able to cry out for the mercy of God. The mom instinct, right? The cry of mercy that expects an answer based on who you are crying to. It is a beautiful thing. The instinct of a mother, the, love, the carrying love of a mother is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I think ultimately, it points us to the heart of God. The cry of mercy that expects an answer based on the character of Jesus Christ. God hears our cries because of Jesus. And we can commit ourselves to him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this image. I thank you for this cry of mercy that expects an answer. And I want to pray right now. I want to, I want to just cry out to you for your mercy. Cry out to your mercy for all the areas of our lives that we need them. For our struggles, the ones we deserve and the ones we don't deserve for our frustrations and our pains and our heartbreaks. Lord, may we look to you and expect an answer. May we learn what it means to commit our spirits to you. Thank you, Lord, for moms. Thank you for Mother's Day. Thank you for this incredible image of your merciful love. May it fill our hearts with love and faith this day. And may we bring glory and honor to you in your name. Amen.